today on Ramblings with Rebecca, we're going to talk about first generation rights. We have in growing prominence in academic conceptions of human rights and also the way activists approach them, uh, this concept of three generations of rights, uh, which are not necessarily following each other in chronological time. So generation is perhaps a bizarre word to use there. Uh, but there is an argument to be said that the generations do follow prominence or how much attention and how much force they have. So like the first generation, generally the oomph ones. But we'll talk as we discuss each of the generations, kind of how much power they have, how all they are enforced and conceived in international law around human rights and that kind of thing. This division of three generations of rights was first proposed by a Czech jurist in the 70s, and it follows the three buzzwords of the French Revolution, actually, liberty, equality, and fraternity. So today we'll be focusing on liberty. This first generation, uh, freedom particularly and most importantly, perhaps freedom from the big evil state. First generation rights very much focus on the really bad things that the state can do to individuals and trying to protect individuals from those bad things. They deal particularly with liberty and participation in public life. They're fundamentally civil and political in nature. Uh, so they include things like the right to vote, the right to a fair trial, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, that kind of thing. First generation rights tend to be fairly negative, so they are framed as freedom from something rather than freedom to do or to have things, generally. Uh, they also generally can come with immediate realization, uh, so because they require an abstention of the state, perhaps the two most famous and potentially important uh, or most fundamental ones are things like freedom from torture and freedom from the death penalty, uh, or at least freedom from arbitrary killing. Um, these don't cost a state something in terms of finances. Uh, you can argue that some things like the f right to the fair trial things do cost things procedurally um, and in systems. So it's not that they're completely cost free, but for the most part, they can have an immediate realization because it is possible for the state to just say, stop shooting people on site. Right. Whereas as we start to get into second generations tomorrow, we'll see the state can't instantly be like housing for everybody. Right. Uh, so here's the first distinction already. As we have these freedoms from the big evil state versus freedoms have other things that we'll get into. Uh, civil and political rights were first enshrined in international law. Uh, well, I should say first mentioned, firstly, universally, uh, in particularly Articles 3 to 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, however, certainly the document as a whole does not follow clean cut this distinction between the generations. Um, but generally speaking, Articles 3 to 21 and the UDHR of 1948 are around civil and political rights. They were codified and given some amount of force um, in the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And here we have explicitly a document that is around civil and political rights rather than the International Covenant on Human Rights. That covenant came into force uh, in 1976 when enough states had ratified it. And this, unlike the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is legally bound, binding to those states which have ratified and signed on to it. There are two optional protocols to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, more commonly referred to, referred to as ICCPR. Uh, the first optional protocol sets up an individual complaints mechanism, whereby individuals can complain to a body of the United Nations, the Human Rights Committee, about violations. So if your state has signed on to the treaty, to the covenant and also to the first optional protocol, you can write a letter letter to the human rights committee and say, help my, you know, this right has been violated, do something about it. Uh, and that will then go through processes and eventually you may well get some kind of remedy. Um, that first protocol doesn't, has quite a lot of parties actually. Most states, most states have signed on to that. Um, and it is legally binding. So that's the first big obvious way that we have now human rights having some kind of enforceability under international legal mechanisms. Uh, the second optional protocol is a very specific one, abolishing the death penalty, um, period, end of story, regardless of what's going on. Uh, countries are allowed to make reservations, opt out moments um, for the use of it in like very serious crimes of a military nature. Tomorrow, 
second generation.